we might um, get started soon, everyone. Uh, so, Yama, everyone, um, thank you all so much for joining us um, for this very special opportunity to hear Dr. Shane Ingray and Ray Ingray talk about the extraordinary plants of their country from knowledge passed down through the generations. This event is part of a series of events marking the eight days that the endeavour was anchored at Game or Game, uh, and it's also a celebration of the the continuation of Darawal uh, culture and knowledge today. For those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Marika Duchinski. I'm a Gomoroi and Manandangi woman, and I've newly joined the Chachakwi Museum team as curator Indigenous heritage. So if you come to more events at the Chachakwi Museum, you'll be seeing my face a lot more. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet, the Gadigal people, as well as the many Aboriginal clan groups who have honoured and cared for this place since the first sunrise. I pay my respects to Elders past and present, and I extend that respect to all First Nations people who join us today also. Uh, we have a publication here, a special publication of copper plate engravings of plants known as Banks Florilegium collected on Captain James Cook's first voyage around the world in the Endeavour, which were gathered and classified by crew on board the Endeavour and were engraved after drawings by Sidney Parkinson. But as we will hear, understandings about the many different plants and their uses were frankly disregarded and an important learning opportunity was lost. There will be an opportunity for a closer inspection uh, of the Florilegium a bit later um, in the event. Uh, so, yeah, just to let you know, you can definitely have a bit of a closer look at that um, towards the end. Uh, and before I hand over to Shane and Ray, there are a number of thanks um, I'd just like to give for making this event possible. Uh, to Shane and Ray, thank you so much for your generosity in sharing your knowledge with us. This is quite an extraordinary privilege, as I'm sure you can all agree. Um, to the Gujaga Foundation, thank you. The University Library, rare books and special collections, as well as the staff here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum who have all worked together to make this event possible. So thank you all so much. Uh, and now would you please join me in welcoming uh, Shane and Ray. Thanks, Marika. Um, we thought we'll, over the next hour, we'll just um, go through a number of things that relate to plants and obviously relate to the Endeavour uh, voyage. Um, but we wanted a setting so we can, not so formal. So we're going to have a bit of a yarn, what, what we call yarn, and, um, and we'll take you through some of the plants that were collected. Um, and observed uh, in the Endeavour voyage, um, the eight days at Kame. Um, and we'll also share some of the cultural knowledge that we have behind those plants and some of the, those meanings and the importance to us, um, which wasn't necessarily picked up, not only during the Endeavour's short stay, but in the first few years of the colony as well. A lot of this knowledge was disregarded. Um, we're happy to take questions if they're burning questions throughout. Um, we're happy to take it, but um, we've got a roaming mic too for, for towards the end where we can, if you've got a question, please ask it as well. But if it's burning and you think you're going to forget it, then happy to, to take the questions throughout the presentation as well. Um, I'm going to bounce between myself and, and Shane um, and um, we'll take you on a bit of a journey how we look at not only plants, but, but our country as well. Um, we share this video and, and those that familiar faces that joined us here two nights ago, um, we shared this video, but it gives you a bit of a, a different view on, on Kame, um, which is our, our word for the Botany Bay area, um, and how we look at our country. And this was developed with the ABC and the National Museum of Australia.
Uh, just a little bit about the Gujaga Foundation. Um, it was created in 2018. Um, our leaders within our community uh, did a forward thinking um, planning workshop with KPMG, a, a long term plan for our community. One of them, the recommendations out of that session was um, we need to have a charitable arm for our community. We need to call it the Gujaga Foundation and it needs to continue to run our language, culture and project-based activities in our community. So um, Gujaga Foundation continues on work that our elders did, research in the 80s and 90s, um, advocacy work around repatriation um, and also to um, continue on work around language reclamation. Gujaga in our language means child child of, of any gender and you can find that um, goes from the central coast all the way down to the south coast as well. Um, the Lapras Aboriginal community is the community that we belong to. Um, the name today is a bit misleading because people just think it's bounded by the suburb La Perouse, but that's not necessarily the case. La Perouse was the place was the name given to our community when the government established it in the, the, late, uh, the mid to late 1800s. Um, in 1883 with the, the creation of the Aborigines Protection Act, uh, the board at the time um, placed us permanently and they shut down camps around Sydney Harbour and Botany Bay and over a period of time moved everybody out to La Perouse, where we're still, still there today. Um, it was well known and documented throughout the 1800s that, that People living at La Perouse descended from the original inhabitants there. Um, and the narrative that we came from the south coast came with a, um, when the government tried to move us to places like Bree Warrena, Walliga Lake, and our old people refused. And so a narrative changed to say, oh, they're from the south coast, so they should just move back there anyways. And that, that changed from the 1900s onwards. But evidence available to show that, that our community was well recognised in that late uh, 1800s as being from there. And we have many families that can trace their ancestry back to, to the arrival of Cook and the first sleep 18 years later. Our little research team um, we have other researchers, voluntary researchers, community researchers within our, our team. But our little team was engaged by the National Museum of Australia to, to be able to tell our story our way. Our community has been advocating to tell our story our way. Um, in the past, people have tried to tell our story for us, but because our community, our elders in particular, were quite private, um, it created a bit of a, a void. Um, and the ongoing frustrations from our elders back then to now still exist because people are trying to tell our story for us and we're sort of buggering up a bit. And so we um, said we'll do that. And we're happy to work today, happy to work with many institutions and, and groups as long as we have the freedom to tell our story our way. And so we worked on the CAME section and part of that CAME section was looking at the plants the plants that were collected by the crew of the Endeavour, particular um, Joseph Banks and his team, and um, to be able to compare that with the cultural knowledge that we have today in our community. So we work with Gweagle and Dorawal elders to, to source that information and to document it and to be able to present it in a way that's culturally appropriate and, and appropriate for, for the broader audience, not just for, for our community or Aboriginal people in general. So when we talk about plants, I just wanted to share with you a little bit about spirituality first. Um, Dural spirituality, um, we attribute the work of everything that's created within our country um, to the work of our spirit ancestors. We use the term spirit ancestors. Other Aboriginal groups might use the term totem. And you could have multiple totems. But our spirit ancestors, in fact, created our country. 
So we understand that all life forms within our country was materialized when those spirit ancestors created that and, and founded those characteristics that relate to, to country. When our spirit ancestors created our country in our dreaming, they created relationships between the living and the non-living entities of country and those relationships gave rise to a specific kinship system that's based on um, us being bonded to our country and our obligation to, to remain on country and look after it. So for us our kinship systems could be uh, in human form but they could also be in spirit form. We also see family as a spiritual interconnectivity with uh, certain parts of our country. And when we refer to country, we talk about land, waterways and skyways. We, we don't just see land boundaries. We see land, waterways and skyways. And everything in between that is what we refer to as our country and we're related to everything in between that. So for us, we can be related to certain land forms of country, certain animals, certain plants, and even certain events that occur, environmental events, etc., that occur, have us related. And plants are key to this. Plants and animals are key to this. Is that okay? Does that make sense? I just wanted to set that so that you can see when we start to talk about plants, the spiritual connection that we have with these plants. A lot of our plants, we have dreaming stories, and here's, an ex here's the children's version of, of this dreaming story that talks about how a certain plant happened. And as you know, the terminology dreaming is used today because it's ongoing. Dream time sort of puts us in, a, in the past and sets us there. And as you'll see that this dreaming story is, occurred even when Dharawal people were still were already here. Me and technology don't get along well, so I'm just hoping that it works. There we go. <coughs>
So that dreaming story relates to particular clan groups along Tukara or Georgia River um, and, and the southern side of, of Gamay. Um, it also tells us things like how that plant came about. Um, so dreaming stories are, you know, feature a lot of animals and plants as well. So for us, we continue to assert our connection with certain animals and stuff because we're spiritually bonded with them through our dreaming. <coughs> and also places and certain environmental events on country also occur. And, and that's not only for Dharawal people and Dharawal country, that's consistent throughout not only New South Wales but Australia as well. So some plants, what we're here for. So there's a bit of a background and I'm going to have a breather in a minute and hand over to, to Shane. Um, but we know through the history books that um, the Endeavour Voyage, uh, Joseph Banks, so Joseph Banks um, funded part of that voyage so that he could actually go on, on his journey and collect as many um, I suppose plants and etc. From, from not only here in Australia but around um, throughout that journey. Many of the, we know many of the plants that were here were unknown to the Europeans at the time. And we know that obviously throughout the eight days because of what happened on the first encounter, the first day, um, it really set a sour relationship. And so with that first act of theft, if I can call it that, and the first act um, of violence that occurred, it really set the tone for our mob to, to not engage with them. Also too, we were seeing them through a spiritual lens, so we were seeing them as, as uh, ghosts that have returned um, from the afterlife and there's a spiritual consequence to engage with them. So a lot of our, our mob um, didn't want to engage with the crew of the endeavour. Um, throughout the presentation, we're going to see some basic information around uh, the scientific or European information, and then we'll go for a bit of a deep dive as much as we can into, into our information around those plants. But we know that there was new plants to, to the crew of the endeavour. Um, for us, there was about, we know there was about 132, um, you know, with around 84, um, sketches but when we look at our country we know they missed out on a whole lot more and potentially if that relationship didn't start the way it started there might have been a better um, better engagement and, and more collection more knowledge gathered um, in the yeah and on from <coughs> Kame and on top of that due to the what Ray said about the cultural reasons and the start of the violence sort of thing and the avoidance um, you know, to the to the um, Cook and Parkinson and everybody and Banks, they were new plants, but because of that lack of communication, they missed out on you know those thousands and thousands of years of botanical and scientific knowledge that we had already. So they missed out on stuff like the names of the plants, their uses, how they were harvested, you know, who was responsible for those plants or related to those plants. Um, sort of <clears throat> sorry um you know missed out on all that knowledge where now we're sort of looking back on these plants that they've collected that we're going to go through a few now and we can now fill in that missing information from our perspective from our i guess continual learning and teaching through the generation so under the plants what did you do your phd in oh, um when it comes to academia, I, I lost that gene somewhere along the way. What did you do your PhD? Yeah. Um, so I looked at uh, medicine plants from around Botany Bay, so around Gamay, and looked at um, microbes that live within the plants. So they call them endophytes. Um, so bacteria and fungi that live within the plants. And then looked at those bacteria and fungi to see if they had any could produce any type of antibiotic or anything like that. So it was sort of a more in-depth look, I guess, at our medicine plants. So using the best available technology we have today can 
go from looking at the plant as a whole into looking at how sort of the plant or what's in the plant, maybe some reasons why the plant's medicinal or things like that. So, and what is yeah, it? I'm not sure. Yeah, bio, what is it? What are you? Oh, it was a mix of molecular biology. So you lost me there. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> yeah. But it's, uh, yeah. So when it comes to plants and especially that type, Shane's our go-to. And Shane work with senior women. They're all women within our community in the early 2000s to record a lot of that cultural knowledge and continues to work with the elders and stuff like that to, to gather it. And whenever Good Jaga Foundation needs to do something on plants, we know Shane's part of that plant team. And then obviously key elders like Uncle Rod and that, that you see up here as well that we engage to do stuff with. And, and so the, this journey was, was no different for us. So Namarag is, a, is a, um, a good plant to probably start off with. And not all these have videos, but I want to show a couple of the videos and then we'll, we'll get you to go online in your own time to, to check out the NMA where there's more videos around the plants there that we did. But for us, Namarag is our word for the um, gold model. Um, we know that um, obviously we use the term Namarag um, I'm not going to say since time began because the language evolves over time. Um, but our, our word for, for this plant is Namarag. Um, we know that the, the, the term wattle came about because of the, they were using this particular plant for dwellings in the early days of the, of the colony. Um, where they weave the, the branches and chuck some mud up and that was the walls of, of some of those dwellings. Um, we won't go into too much detail, but each, each plant that we put up, you'll see the distribution of it, where, where it's found. Um, Parkinson's drawing, so he did sketches and then later on they got finished off by, um, they say either himself or other people later on. Um, done it in watercolour, etc. And then we've got some um, images that the NMA use, which come from the Australian National um, Botanic Gardens as well. I just thought I'll put that in there in case like, someone comes back at me with copyright issues. <laughs> I acknowledged everyone there. So for us, the Namarag is, a, is an important um, plant, and I'm going to try and cover them without even looking at them. But, um, you know, we use a lot of plants that we use are, are not only a spiritual connection, so some featuring dreaming stories or connected to certain clan groups or parts of clan groups in a spiritual way. Um, but we also make sure that we use the plants for, you know, not just pick one thing off and waste. So usually food, medicine and fibre is usually the three main things that we would use plants for. And so... Um, we know that the Namarag is important in that sense. We also, our elders tell us that our country speaks to us. And so when we actually go out with our elders, they teach us to look for certain things in country and they are usually indicators for what's either happening or about to happen. And so we know the Namarag is a real good one because when she starts to flower, we know that a particular species, Yanga, the lobster, is marching in. And they're looking for uh, mates. So they're looking for a partner to mate with. And so you won't find them anywhere but on the seaweed. And we know when that dies and another flower comes, they found their mates and you'll find them in the hole. So even today we go looking for that. We see that and we know our young kids know where to go looking so they're not looking somewhere else where they won't be. And so that indicates to us, and when the branches are real, real sad looking, you know, real heavy on the ground, our elders teach us that's when Taylor fish is travelling and they're ready to be, to be caught. And so we're able to um, look at that plant and see it and be able to tell what's happening within our country by just seeing what's happening with that plant at that particular time. We know that some of the, um, we use the, um, the wattle numrugs really good for our kids to, to um, create prongs for their spears.
because of the flexibility in it. So if they hit a rock and stuff, it doesn't um, do too much damage to the prongs of the spears. And so it's a very good way that we, they use it a lot when they're practicing where they're not that good at, at, at the spears as well. And we can use them for other types of implements as well. Um, I think the other one there is, um, you know, we can use the ropes, uh, the bark for, for things such as rope and, and, and strings as well. And I'm just going to, um, around the bush soap and the, the catching of small fish and yabbies and stuff in the creek systems, I'm going to leave that up to Uncle Roddy here. Um, he's probably better one to explain it than, than me. But... Um, Only if they would have found out, the endeavour would have found out that you could make soap out of oil. So that little trick would have come in handy, eh? Yeah, for the so if anyone's got a burning question at those plants, ask it, but other than that, we'll wait to the end. And hopefully this isn't like a too fast. If I'm moving too fast for people, just let me know too. So barn barn or the coastal tea tree, um, Obviously, you know, there's some information that the, the crew took. We understand that the uh, crew of the Endeavour substituted this for a tea um, on their voyage, but that's not really um, something that's encouraged to do. Wouldn't drink it as tea. Um, but Barn Barn is an is a, a interesting one. Um, because they can be used as an uh, insect and small uh, reptile repellent as well for our people. Um, our old people say you, we grab a bunch of the leaves, you heat it up over coals, not flames, but heat it up over coals, and you can rub that on sores and scratches and stuff, and it'll, it'll act as a, um, it'll heal that up for the you know, medicinal purposes, colds and flus and stuff like that. Um, we know when the, the flower's on, there's a particular shellfish that's ready to be collected, so it's time when we go out looking for pippies and when they're big and fat and juicy. Um, and obviously if they're not manicured or they're not maintained, where they start to bend and stuff, we can make, that's what we make our shelters from, the structure of our shelters. And you're able then to use, um, make rope from Grinley or Namurag and you're able to then bind it all up as well. 
So that's a way. The other one that um, they talk about, you're able to bundle them up to and tie them up and you can make a broom to clean out your camp or rake things along if you needed them as well. So it comes in handy quite a bit. Um, I've got a, there's a, there's a video online too on the NMA which I'll promote and that's a good one of Uncle Rod talking about Barn Barn there too. Uh, with Dungaree, um, and this one's probably the most, or well, with Dungaree and, and Garija, probably the most two, the different types of banksias that were collected. It was obviously um, quite new to the Europeans. Um, the language names that we use are from Sydney Harbour down into the Illawarra. And we use the most common names that we use today. There's, we know plant species that are associated to women have a particular, a women use a particular name for those plant species. Um, there might be a particular dreaming story that relates to that. So we use, we'll just use the most common one that's not so offensive to men or women or children or adults, etc. Uh, what Tungri is, uh, um, tells us um, it re relates to a durable dreaming story and it, that dreaming story tells us why Watangri looks the way that he does, um, rough skin and why the flowers are sweet with the nectar as well. Um, we know that it's a good little spot to um, where because it attracts small birds and, and animals so it's a good little spot to go hunting to gather some of those if you want a snack or you want something quick to eat. Um, we also, we know when it's at the peak of its flowering, when it's nice and fluffy and particularly when the mornings are cold, you can go and grab them and make a drink. And usually I've seen a couple of our older people, they'll just put the thing in the mouth and get the nectar out or they'll go and find, you know, some warm water or something and mix it up and use it as a bit of a sweet drink as well. And even today, we still use the cobs for um, keeping the fire, like our hot beads, you know. You know, you buy hot beads from Bunnings and on your barbie. Yeah, well, we can use that. We use those cobs as well in, in that same fashion. You want to talk in Greenland? Yeah. 
Yes, the next one's Grinley. Um, I think the common name for it's Matt Rush that you can find out. Um, these are used mainly today for landscaping. It's you know very easy to grow. You see them on the roadways. Usually cut them out a few months later because they overgrow onto the roads and stuff. So um, this is another multi-use plant. It is so. Um, I guess the first thing they use the leaves to for weaving. So for weaving baskets and bracelets and. Um, you know, using as binding as well, some of the um, tools. Um, if you see these plants, you can pull them. If you get down to the root, you can pull them out and you'll have a fleshy white base on the bottom. You can, once you get the dirt off it, you can chew on that, which um, sort of a bit like celery, I guess. You can, you know, a lot of water in there and you can chew on it for a little bit as well, keep yourself occupied. Um, it's also used to help with stings, mainly ants and insect stings. Um, when they're when green, eh? When, they're, when the seeds are real green and yeah. big, they had, uh, um, they'd harvest them, eh? Yeah, yeah. Harvest them and then dry them out, husk them, so the bits fall off, and then what they grind it up into the yeah, into flower based flour type. Based. And that was to make small dampers and stuff. Yeah, only little biscuits yeah, like little type. Johnny Cake type things. And there's still young ones in our community, that, young women that know how to make that mm. the old way. Yeah, so it's something that we want to continue to teach our young ones how to make some of those old, old type foods. Yeah. And also those plants, like with a lot of the other plants as well, you'll find small reptiles and small animals that you could you know, that would frequent around those plants that you can go and catch and hunt if you're, you know, looking for something to eat as well. We know, um, Jude, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, but on um, Saturday, the weaving workshop, I don't know for who it's open. Is it open to...? If people get in contact with us, we can open Yeah. So they'll, they'll go more into the weaving side and how the techniques and stuff like that, and they'll talk a bit about the Grinley plant on, on Saturday as well, which would be good. Mm -hmm. And because you've got old EP, they might go out and show show first hand how to do it. Uh, Guruga is another one, um, which is our you know bracken fern, our name for bracken fern. Um, again, on the NMA website, if you click on the sound that the, um, Uncle Rod's pronouncing all these words, so you can go on and practice if you want to learn the Dharawal names for these plants. Um, and obviously it's uh, in, in coolie type climates you'll find them, but a lot of wet areas, creek beds and stuff, we'll get a whole heap of these. Um, we know that uh, Guruga for us, um, it's a very useful resource and it's used multiple ways. So um, we would, because um, we didn't waste things, you know, they would actually pull the plant out. Our old people would pull the plant out if they were setting up camp and they could use the ferns as a base. So they've got not sleeping in the dirt, so they'll cover it as using a, a base for the, their humpies. Um, if it's got the little fern part, the little new, new fern that's, while it's still rolled up, you'd pull that out and you'd rub it on saws or it's like our stingos type treatment. Um, the, the root part, they'll clean it up and roast it lightly and chew on it and it's supposedly, our older ones were telling us it's got a nutty taste, I refuse to eat it. <laughs> um, but they tell us that it's that nutty taste that it has with them. And then the, um, there's a particular basket that gets made that helps the um, women and children carry shellfish like crabs and stuff like that, so they don't bite you. And so they'll um, create these big baskets um, using vine and then wrap the whole plant within that. So the stem and the leaf, and that's used then to carry like fruit crabs so they won't fully kill them. Um, shellfish and stuff, so you'll be able to carry it from the close coastline all the way up into the you know, into the river systems. And that's why there's a lot of middens and stuff up in our river systems that have things that come from the coastline. 
because they would carry them up there to, to sit and eat them, etc. Um, but that one's a, a real important one as well, and um, it can grow quite plentiful. And then sometimes you go there and it's gone again because of the temperatures warmed up and that little bit of that environment has changed. So we always keep a little lookout for for that plant. And there's a video that screenshot that photo comes from a video that of Uncle Rod explaining to his granddaughter Cody on how they make those baskets. So again jump on the NMA website and have a look. Look at that. Um, this is probably one of the most important ones that we have in regards of plants. Um, we know that in the early days the smaller ones they were harvest them um, you know called it cabbage on the inside hence the cabbage tree palm. Um, and Banks talked about, you know, not very big ones and they would go and, um, you know, they would harvest them, I suppose, for food. And looking for poles as well, but found it wasn't really good for using poles. Yeah. As like mast, ship mast and stuff like that. <coughs> and another, I think it was the first hat in Australia, when they came, was made from the cab, they called it a cabbage tree hat. Was like cabbage tree palm oh, hat. Quite popular in the 1800s, yeah, hats were made. Yeah. Because so obviously the sun, it's not yeah. English weather over here. So. Then I think it ended up, from what I remember, I think it was a hat that the sort of upper class person wore and then it sort of faded out to sort of the street hooligans and stuff, ended up wearing it and then it sort of went out of fashion early on in the colony. So Because of the, uh, the stems weren't necessarily good for... Construction shingles. I think they started to use a block shingles on the roofs and stuff like that. So these were, but as soon as you take that cabbage tree part, the cabbage part out of that middle, it kills the whole plant as well. So um, our people, why our people would have seen it is that for Dural people, this is our overarching spirit ancestor. So in other cultural groups, like on my Dungati side, our overarching spirit ancestor is the Gurigan or the Praymanthus. So everyone that belongs to the Dangati has a spiritual connection to the Prey Mantis. And that connects us in a spiritual way to other Gurigan or Prey Mantis people around Australia. And so for us Dharawal people, our overarching spirit ancestor is Dharawal, the cabbage tree palm. So to see, you know, not only the things that happen on the first day, but throughout the eight days, this and then obviously in the first part the colony and being removed quite quickly that would have been a bit of a, an upset and a shock to our people. So Dharawal today has a number of meanings. It's because it is our overarching spirit ancestor, everyone that belongs to that or to our cultural group identifies with being Dharawal. It's the language that we speak because it's related to our overarching spirit ancestor. And so today it's what we use as a collective. So we call ourselves Dharawal tribe, Dharawal nation or Dharawal people in doing so. But it's a spiritual identity um, for our people. We're connected to it. It gives us that because we're connected through our dreaming um, and through a life and death ceremony where the Dharawal palm features in that. And so, and it is part of our, our reincarnation journey as well, like our, our, um, our journey to the afterlife, if that makes sense. So we're heavily connected and to see that then get, you know, where you get harvested, rip all that middle out, dies, or to see it being chopped down for construction purposes in the early days of the colony, that would have been a, a, an upset to our people just like any other cultural group, if you go and harm something that their spirit ancestor, they'll be very upset as well. Missed opportunity. We had a couple of plants listed out here, but we thought we'll test our memory and go off the top of our heads. Yeah. Um, as Shane mentioned, there was 132 you know, plants identified, um, collected um, and documented. They um, that wasn't 
But there was no, a lot more. Yeah, there were a lot more plants. And when we say missed opportunities, um, you know, some of the plants that we know, still know and grow around um, Kame and we still use today. So I think the first one was the grass tree. So I think that's the shafts. They use the flower stalk to make the a type of fishing spear, which is I think the ones out there, mm. possibly made out of that grass tree. Um, the gum from the gut, the grass tree as well, also has we think it's um, can be heated up and molded, and it's waterproof. Um, you know, it's used to fix spearheads, axe heads, fix holes in canoes. Um, I think how we use it, you can reuse it. So if it bits fall off, you can reheat it, use it again, where the gum from the eucalyptus trees and stuff are, will crack up once it dries. It cracks up and it's no good. Um, that plant also attracts birds. They swing off the, when it's flowering, the birds will come and drink the nectar and swing off the top of them, make them easier to catch. And also the little marsupials and stuff as well. What was the one used for sore boils and sore teeth and oh yeah so the hot bush I forget the scientific name but hot bush still grows around so it's um the root and leaves were used chewed help toothaches and stings marine stings um still growing and around especially around Kernel in the national park um native sarsaparilla can be chewed or boiled up to one of our medicines for um so our sort of like a good blood, cleanse your blood. Um, also, there's been some recent research on it to help out with diabetes as well. It shows the lower blood sugar levels and um, interesting the way we prepare it sort of mirrors how they came to find this um, compound. I forget what it was. That is the active compound around it. Um, what was the other one? I don't know. You're the expert, no. <laughs> I think it was, the, a few, like oh, it was a prickly current bush. So there's a little bush that grows in the eastern banks of scrub that's found around Larpa still. Um, and that was just a, there's little tiny red fruit that you collect and it's just got like a, like a sweet bitter type taste. I think it's high in vitamin C. Um, you know, it would have been eaten just for general health. But I think the reason why a lot of these plants were missed is because a lot of these plants around um, Kame flower and fruit in the late spring, early summer. So, you know, they might not have seen the flowers or the fruit on these plants. They might have just blended in like nothing stood out to them. So they sort of just, you know, walked past or walked over them, didn't collect any of them. And again, without that communication, didn't realise the importance, um, you know, the diet, the uh, medicinal importance of those plants. Mm. Um, also the time limited, they're only here for eight days, so they pretty much stuck to the coastline, didn't get to go in inland where like a lot of the uh, sort of rainforesty or the different um, plant communities, I guess, grew. So they got a lot of the coastal plant communities. Um, and then again, this, just the space they had on so they collected 132 plants and they had to fit it somewhere. So I think they sort of cut themselves off to leave some room as well. So, yeah. um, I'll just plug the NMA. So if you, again, like if you want, there's a um, the website address if you want to go on and have a look at that knowing plants section um, that not only here for Kame, but, you know, the mob up in... Uh, Google Yimothi country and elsewhere also showcase some of their plants and some missed opportunities that were happened um, throughout the, the voyage as well. So go and have a look at that and uh, it's a good resource as well for teaching, etc. Um, just want to leave you on, on this because plants weren't just about medicinal purposes, etc. As I mentioned, it's um, around making implements and we're here for the spears as well. Um, so you'll see some of the plants, the different types of plants that we use to make spears. Um, it's a workshop that we do um, quite often with Uncle Rod Mason to teach our kids about not only making spears but using spears. 
and he'll talk, you'll hear him teaching the kids some of the Dharawal words for um, the different plants or parts of those plants that they're using to make their uh, Gararas. Um, question time. Thank you both so much. Does anyone have any questions for Shane and Ray? That's either a good thing or a bad thing. I'm trying to work out. What, yes. what that is. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, so um, the barn barn uh, tea tree, which I'm guessing doesn't have anything to do with the tea tree oil source. No? No. Okay. No. Um, okay, because it's narrow distribution of the. I don't know anything about the tea tree oil plant, but. So. You mentioned that they use it as a replacement for tea, but it's not recommended. The Endeavour crew, yeah. The Endeavour crew, right. Yeah. So I'm guessing out of the 132 plants that they collected, they chose that one for tea, perhaps because it had similar qualities, perhaps uh, it gave some effect like tea does, like caffeine does, maybe. Um, is, do you know why they chose that? And, why it's recommended against? No, um, I think they, yeah, it. I think they, um, one of the things they look for was a substitute for tea because they'd been on the boat for so long and right. obviously coming from Britain, they love their tea. So yeah. that's why there's a lot of plants that are called tea tree, but different species because they, um, same with hop bush, I understand there's different species that they called the general name hop bush because they were looking for ways to make beer and other drinks that 
they just sort of generalised sort of thing. So I think it was a lot of experimenting. And it could have been... Probably more desperation by the sounds of it, eh? Hey, wouldn't their tea that bad, they'll use anything. And why did you, yeah, why did you suggest it's bad it's not recommended? Um, well, in the, in the project that we did, um, it, they come to the conclusion, the experts, that it's not something that, you know, we don't want people to go out thinking they can just get coastal tea tree and make a drink out yeah. of it. Um, similar to the tea tree oil that you get, you shouldn't be drinking that either. So <laughs> it's probably the same... Same thing, eh? Might make you crook. Yeah, yeah. I should have explained at the start that um, you know a lot of the plants before they're used are treated in different ways. So you know some will leach out the poison, like say for the barawang. If the seeds they used to use to make dampers and breads, it's toxic if you pick it straight off the plant. But um, there were different ways they'd leach the poison out, so they'd leave it in running fresh water or bury it for a certain amount of time till the toxins were gone, and then, um, you know, then they would use it. Um, I know in the early days of colony, they saw blackfellas picking these things, and a few people just tried to make it and obviously got really sick. So, um, yeah, it's sort of just a general warning. It's not recommended unless you go out with someone or... Somebody shows you how to, you know, Taught, yeah. prep it properly so you don't get sick. And then come back and find Raymond and say, you said this was a tea substitute. Don't find me, no. <laughs> so, Thanks. Yeah. No, no worries. Thank you both so much. Um, the question comes from what you were just talking about. Do you, when you look at those 130-something species... Do you think there are some that obviously they were watching what people were doing on the shore and they thought, oh, they're going to that one, we'll take that? Like, can you see reasons behind the collection of those specific plants based on how people might have been using them at that season? Or do you think it was really much more random in the choices that they were making because they were flowering or...? Yeah, I think personally they just grabbed what they could sort of thing while they were there. Um, like Ray said, there was that avoidance... They did observe for a little bit until they were seen and then people would sort of get away from them. So, um, yeah, and a lot of the pictures do have flowers in them. So it would have been the flowering plants around at that time, sort of April, late March, April, or sorry, April, May. Um, one that stood out. Yeah, eh? one that stood out. Stood out. And then probably near the end, they, you, know, you can only assume they were nearly leaving, so they just sort of grabbed as many samples as they could. Mm. So probably a bit of both, Jude, probably yeah. that ones that were quite visible and then they probably, and at that time, observed probably Aboriginal people in and around the bay doing things with those, you know, with those particular plants because that, that was the thing that there was a lot of observation occurring of what the Aboriginal people were doing in and around Gamay. Um, so it's probably a bit of both. What was available or seen to the naked eye and then and then what, what Aboriginal people were doing or collecting. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for that talk. That was fantastic. Um, I was really blown away by the story of the praying mantis. So I was just wondering if you do a sequel on extraordinary animals, um, who are the stars of the show <laughs> going to be? Yeah, we, um, yeah, we got a few, few around the place. Um, yeah, a lot of, a lot of the, spiritual connection that we have with animals, um, similar to plants, but animals um, in Dharawal country. Um, we have dreaming stories where a lot of animals were in human form. And when they, um, in that dreaming story, they turned into the animals as we know it. So when we look at them, it explains why they have human characteristics or why their behaviours are the way they are. Um, and our dreaming story informs us why that's the case. Yeah, so we probably could do one on, on animals, definitely. Any other questions? Yep. Hi, that was really great. Thanks very much. I was just interesting when you were talk interested when you were talking about the spirituality and the realms of it being the ground, the sea and the skyways. When you include the skyways, do you include the animals in the sky, the plants, underwear, yeah. the birds, what, 
Um, or is it just the wind? No, no, so it's the wind, the animals, the universe. So we have, you know, like uh, Marada and Mulyan, so the uh, eagles, sea eagle, and in a lot of Aboriginal cultures, and Darwin in particular, um, but a lot of Aboriginal cultures, they're, they're birds of significant because they fly closest to mineral our creator. So like they're of importance. Um, we've got um, dreaming stories that relate to like certain star constellations. Um, so um, yeah, so when we look at the sky, it's yeah, wind, it's um, rain, storms, um, animals, and, and the universe. Yeah, yeah, no worries. I think we probably have time for maybe one more. If someone, I saw one more hand, yeah. Hi, um, oh God. <laughs> um, I really loved learning um, the traditional names for different plants. Um, like recently started working in a nursery on Darrow land, um, so that's really cool, supplementing my knowledge. Um, I'm just wondering if there are any like more comprehensive language resources that you could um, point me towards. Yeah, um, the Good Jaga Foundation's got a language and culture app, so you can, if you uh, just look up, either it's on the website, so there's a link there to the either uh, Apple Store or Google Store, whatever they call it. I'm hopeless with all that stuff, but um, yeah, we've got a language and culture app that's always getting cultural information, language and stuff being put on there. Um, so download that or just inquire and they should have some resources that they can help out. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you both so much. Right. Um, my head is spinning from, yeah, everything I've just learned about some of the amazing, or should I say extraordinary plants um, of this country, this place where we all live. I think it's, um, yeah, it just blows my mind to think of all the things that that I don't know about the plants that are around me and I've lived here for so long. Well, I actually live down on the south coast but also spent many years living in Sydney and it's just, yeah, it's amazing what we don't know. So thank you both so much for sharing your knowledge with us and I hope one day I also meet Uncle Rod because I'd love to thank him too for, yeah, sharing everything that he does. Um, I especially love that beautiful video of him with the boys <laughs> teaching them um, how to spear. Yeah, it's just beautiful. Um, so I think that, yeah, concludes uh, today's Extraordinary Plants session. Thank you all so much for coming along. Um, if you would like to have a closer look at the Florilegium, please do. Um, we invite you to have a closer inspection, um, but I'm obliged to please ask you to not touch. <laughs> um, and would you all please join me in thanking Shane and Ray. Thank you.